Hello, can you hear me well? Yeah, okay. So welcome everyone to my talk, how to increase diversity in open source projects. I'm Maren Westermann and yeah, a few more words about me. I am from Oldenburg in Germany, near Bremen, represented by the Bremen town musicians in the top corner of the slide. I did a PhD on the intersection of agricultural and environmental science at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. And after that, I transitioned to data science and after that to machine learning. And now at Deutsche Bahn, I am actually responsible for using machine learning to reduce delays. <laughs> so <laughs> if it doesn't work out over time, you know where to complain. Um, yeah, I'm an active contributor to open source, um, as Hannah highlighted, and I'm also a PyLadies Berlin co-organizer. So let's talk about diversity. So I've got a definition of diversity here that I really like. It's by the Linux Foundation, and I'll read it out to you. So they say, we define diversity within open source communities as a pluralism of any number of the following possibilities. Gender identity and expression, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, so social class, caste, language, physical and neurological ability or attributes, religious beliefs, value systems, national origin, and political affiliation. So now that we have an understanding of what diversity is, let's look at the state of diversity in open source projects. Let's look at some data. So the Linux Foundation did a survey and they found that among open source contributors, 82% of people identify as male, 14% of people identify as female, and only 4% of people identify with other genders. And when you look at the number of female core developers among open source projects, you find that only 5% of open source projects actually have female core developers. Let's look at ethnic diversity. So you can see here on the slide that 36% of contributors come from the USA alone, followed by 36% of contributors from all um, across Europe, followed by 15% from the Asia Pacific region, followed by 8% from Central and South America, followed by only 5% from Africa and the Middle East. So you can see that there's a strong overrepresentation of people from the global north. And I could go over more examples of diversity, such as age distribution or identification uh, with the LGBTQI community, for example, but we only unfortunately have 30 minutes, so I wanted to show you two examples and we can talk more about other aspects of diversity later. So what are the consequences of this lack of diversity? There are consequences for the underrepresented groups as well as for open source projects. For people belonging to underrepresented groups, the consequences are mainly loss of opportunities, such as loss of skill development or lack of skill development, and um, not such good career advancement possibilities. For open source projects, the consequences are mainly a lack of diversity of perspectives, which leads to lower problem-solving capacity, less robust technologies, lower productivity, we know this today, and also a susceptibility to unhealthy work environments. So in summary, diversity means resilience, and if you have low diversity, on your open source project, it means that, it's, that it has a reduced ability to adapt to change. So if you, if you are running an open source project and you want it to be successful in the long run, you better have good diversity. So before we talk about the strategies, um, what you can do to um, have a better diversity on your team, let's look at the challenges that people face, like why, why is the diversity so low in open source projects. 
And the challenges are mainly social, such as lack of peer parity or non-inclusive communication or a toxic culture, as I just mentioned, or expectation issues. Um, people might be expected to take on advanced tasks very soon without the appropriate support. Or there might be gender biasing or stereotyping. For example, women might be ex expected to take on communication tasks. Um, there's also the problem of imposter syndrome. I once found a really good definition of imposter syndrome. I think it was on, it was on Twitter. And it was high expectations, low support. So many people from underrepresented groups in tech are actually career changers, so they often need a bit more support. And this is why so many people from these groups suffer from imposter syndrome. And there are also issues such as work-life balance um, issues. For example, many women still carry out the majority of care tasks, for example, most it's mostly women who do um, aged care work or who do child care work, mostly non-paid, and so often women simply have less time. And then there are other challenges, such as language access. In many parts of the world, English education is not great, and so people struggle with contributing to open source because generally the default language of open source projects is English, and so that is a barrier. Then there are also educational access problems, like for example, people might not be able to attend conferences or hackathons or internships simply because they lack the finances or the time. Then there are geographic access problems, especially when you lived in Oceania, like me. I mean, I lived in a wealthy country, Australia, but if you, for example, live in Fiji and you would like to attend um, conferences or meetings. Mostly these meetings are at night time for you and it's really not a great time for you to attend meetings. And um, also, <clears throat> and staying with the example of Fiji, um, you might not have constant reliable internet access. Um, in many countries, developing countries, for example, there's simply no stable internet connection or even not, not even a stable electricity um, supply. And then there are also economic and professional access problems, such as many people are not compensated for their open source contributions. And sometimes employers don't approve of people doing open source contributions either during work hours or even outside of work hours, because employers are sometimes afraid that knowledge from within the company might leak into open source projects, which I find a bit crazy, but okay. And then there is also generally a lack of sponsorships and mentorships. So now that we understand the challenges, what are some of the strategies that we can apply to address these problems? One important strategy is to use inclusive language, such as don't use guys. Use more inclusive language, such as folks. You can say hi, folks, or hi, everyone. And also, if you have a master branch, please rename it to main. If you have master and slave nodes, please use primary, secondary, or other language. Also, try to avoid saying man hours. Please say engineer, or even better, personal hours. Also, please don't use derog derogatory terms such as so simple your mother can do it. It's better to use uh, user-friendly, for example. And also, please don't assume someone's gender. You simply don't know how someone identifies in terms of gender until you ask them or unless it is written somewhere, for example, on their social media profiles. So always ask for people's pronouns. Then I would also like to highlight a good contributing to documentation. Um, this is important and it's also important to keep it up to date. And I would like to highlight an example here on the left hand side uh, from Pandas. Um, it was about eight months ago that I tried to contribute to Pandas and I simply wasn't able to install the dev version of Pandas. 
I tried to follow the contributing to documentation, but it was quite outdated. And on Gitter, where people can go and ask questions, I noticed that other people have the same problem. And so I opened an issue, and so together with the team members of Pandas, the issue got fixed, and now with Pandas 2.00, the uh, contributing to Pandas documentation is up to date, and it works at least on Unix-based systems. Um, not sure about Windows systems, I don't have a Windows computer, but if you are on a Windows computer and you would like to contribute to open source, I can highly recommend to install Windows subsystem for Linux because that makes your life a whole lot easier. <laughs> and I would also like to highlight, please don't shame open source core members for not having an up-to-date contributing to documentation. Many open source projects such as Pandas are mainly run by volunteers and they are really busy with, busy with just maintaining the project and so sometimes they simply don't have the time to keep the documentation up to date and so for example me opening the issue was actually welcome so and yeah it was really it was really great and it was really great for me to see that this got fixed and then also i have an example here from scikit-learn quite regularly when I contribute to scikit-learn, it happens to me that I run PyTest and then I get an import error and then I realize like, oh, okay, some Thyssen files have probably been updated and I need to do a recompile and I, need to, and I do a recompile. And this is pretty standard. And I realized that this is actually not really documented on the contributing to scikit-learn page. And so I opened an issue for that and the maintainers really welcomed that because they realized oh yeah, this actually isn't really documented and actually this is a barrier for people when they try to contribute to open source projects or like in this case scikit-learn. And um, so currently it's still under discussion how to best update the um, documentation but soon it should be updated as well. So if you find such is um, issues or such problems, um, feel free to open an issue um, at the respective open source project and generally your contribution will be really welcome because often maintainers are so experienced they don't even realize what barriers are for new contributors. Then what's also really important is to have contributing to documentation in different languages. Data Umbrella, for example, who have run a lot of sprints together with um, scikit-learn and also other projects, they for example, ran a workshop for people targeted, um, targeted uh, for, for people, sorry, for people from um, Southern America. And um, so what they did was that they translated the contributing to scikit-learn documentation to Spanish and Portuguese, and this was really helpful for people actually. And then you can also be encouraging and welcoming. That's also a great strategy. So for example, when you see a new contributor, you can say, thanks a lot for your contribution. We really value your contribution. And here at the bottom, I'm showing an example of my first pull request to scikit-learn, where Thomas, one of the co-developers said, I see this is your first time contributing, welcome. And it did make me feel more welcome. I found this was really nice. And I also have an example from the Pandas project. Um, I then started contributing to Pandas <laughs> after I figured out how to install the development uh, version of Pandas. And I made a pull request and um, on one day, Marco Gorelli, one of the core contributors, he made a pull request review and on that day I was, I was not having a great day, I was feeling sick and um, then I looked at my notifications and I saw that he included a really cute cat gif <laughs> in his pull request review. And I have to say it made my day and I found it was, it was just really cute. And yeah, I'm, I'm advocating for more cute cat gifs or photos and pull request review, reviews. <laughs> 10 minutes left, okay, oops, good. Um, well, okay, then I think I have to speed up a little bit. Um, you can also promote specific groups and events through, exam for example, you can run events through um, organizations such as PyLadies or Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, and there are also other groups that are targeted towards underrepresented, underrepresented people in 
tech. And it's also important to like and share social media posts to increase visibilities, visibility. And um, you can also run events in schools and universities and um, give priority to people from underrepresented groups. And what you can also do, as I just said before, you can run online events targeted at people from geographically underrepresented regions. Then it's also important to promote awareness of the presence of peers. For example, at conferences like these, you can make sure you have um, good speaker diversity and please also promote on social media. For example, Pi Ladies Berlin has been highlighting all the Pi Ladies speakers of this conference, so please uh, like and tweet, retweet. <laughs> and you can also, if you run workshops um, targeted at people from underrepresented groups in tech write blog articles about it. You can also do contributor interviews with people from underrepresented backgrounds so that you increase the visibil visibility of these people. And in general, it's always good and important to recognize people's achievements. Then please don't um, stereotype um, open software, open, sorry, open source software contributors. Um, don't automatically assign community building tasks, for example, to underrepresented groups. Um, it's better to spread the workload and please don't refer to your female developers as female or women developers. Just say developers to be more inclusive. Then another really important strategy is to have mentorship. And I'm citing here leaders at the mentorship program at the Linux Foundation. They said that Mentorship is invaluable to improving diversity and inclusion in open source communities because it lowers barriers to entry and onboarding and it really helps with networking and it helps junior contributors to being able to establish themselves and it also really helps new contributors with career development. And I would like to highlight this book by Athena Rising. It's called How and Why Men Should Mentor Women. I haven't read it yet, but apparently it's a great book, so please go ahead and read it. And I would also like to highlight two more examples. So I would like to point out that I'm not getting paid by any of the open source projects or companies I'm presenting here, and I'm not getting any benefits. I'm just highlighting examples that I have come across um, now. Scikit-learn is running a five-month paid internship for people to contribute to open so, uh, con sorry, to contribute to Scikit-learn and is targeted towards underrepresented groups in tech. And Quantsight is currently running a very similar initiative. And these in initiatives simply weren't there a couple of years ago. And so this is really great to see. Then another point that's really important is to have uh, good governance. Ideally, you have a governance board, and ideally there is transparency around how our leaders determined and how our contributors onboarded and managed and supported, and it's important to have transparent career pathways. And it's important to promote people from underrepresented groups to leadership roles. And it's really important to value non-coding contributions to the project. For example, if you have a communications team, please also value the, the contributions of the communi communications team. And it's a really good idea to not have a technical committee, but to have a steering committee, for example, which also includes people from, for example, the communications team. And it's also good to have a triaging team. A triaging team is a team where people have access write access to GitHub and they can label and edit issues, for example. And it's also important to make incremental changes over time. Please don't go ahead and like fully restructure everything because people need to adapt to changes and you need to give them the time and space to adapt to them. And then the last point is to create and enforce a code of conduct. Um, a code of conduct can signal to marginalize people that the open source community cares and it provides guidance for newcomers and provides reference for core values and norms. And yeah, it's really important to have a dedicated code of conduct team 
or if you don't have the time to deal with it, you can also hire professionals to follow up on code of conduct breach reports. And now I would like to highlight some uh, literature. Uh, many points that I have presented today come from the research of Bianca Trinkenreich. Um, she has done a lot of research on diversity and inclusion in um, software. So yeah, please go ahead and read her research. She is amazing, she does amazing work. And I would also like to highlight this book that recently came out by Professor Christina Dunbar-Hester. It's called Hacking Diversity. And she has done extensive research on diversity in open source communities. And her conclusion is that the lack of diversity stems from an unequal cultural distribution of social power. And so her point is that because of that, it's really hard to increase diversity in open source projects. And I have to say that Initially, that made me feel a bit powerless because I thought like, okay, so there's a wider systemic issue and so, so should we just put our hands in our laps and wait for society in general to change or what? <laughs> um, but that's not the point she's, ma she's making. So she's saying that it's hard, but I mean, it's also not impossible. I've seen it in the professional world, like the, um, uh, like the non-open source world, uh, the industry world, um, that it is possible to create really diverse teams. And I find that open source projects are in a powerful position because they are so widely used and people have a look at them and look at who is actually behind these projects. And so if we manage to build diverse open source communities, this can have a strong ripple effect. And I could tell a lot of stories about how even just one person really made a difference. Um, but I would like to conclude my talk with saying that everyone can make a difference. So each of you here can definitely make a difference and contribute to improving diversity in open source. So thanks a lot. These are my references. And I'm also on social media. You can find me on Mastodon, Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, whichever you prefer. And thanks for listening. Thank you for this great talk, Maren. Um, there are some questions. You can still ask questions as well. Um, so um, the first question is um, um, very true. Um, again, another event about diversity, almost empty in an event full of white male global no um, northers. How to address that? I think it's actually not a question for you, but the people who didn't come. <laughs> uh, I would love to go outside and ask them, but yeah. Do you have an answer? Yeah, I mean, when you want to build diverse communities, you need a lot of persistence and patience. And I can see, for example, that at this conference, there are many more women, or at least I assume so. I mean, as I said, you should never um, you should never, <clears throat> um, you should never assume someone's gender. Um, but I can see a lot more, di a lot more diversity this year, for example, than last year. And I feel like slowly things are changing, but the change is slow, unfortunately. And I think we all need to work together to push for better diversity. Yeah, yeah. And I would like to add, like last year, it was the diversity was the keynote. So maybe that's also an option. <laughs> um, uh, the next question is, um, some people propose that the GitHub account should be agnostic to gender identity. What do you think? That is a good point. But it's also hard, right? Like, I mean, again, like you should never assume someone's gender, but like when people 
have a photo on their GitHub account, I have a photo, like people generally assume someone's gender. So, I mean, you could force everyone to not have a photo, <laughs> but then it's also becoming very impersonal. That it's yeah. a very tricky question. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Then also everybody had to have a, like a gender neutral nickname and not like appear with their like um, real name. Yeah, it has definitely happened to me that um, I have been discriminated um, because of my appearance, but that was on Stack Overflow. Like I answered on Stack Overflow and an hour later my answer was deleted even though it was relevant. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, um, and in, on Stack Overflow you appear with your like uh, name and your yeah. picture? Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, the examples shown were very big projects. Do smaller projects with only few maintainers need to apply a different strategy to be more inclusive? That's a good question. I wouldn't, hmm, maybe. I wouldn't say necessarily different strategies, but I think smaller projects have more leverage because they're smaller. And so there are less people um, you need to have a consensus with. So I think you can, I think you can potentially act faster. I think it's an advantage, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, one more question. Oh, they're coming more. Let me um, have a look. Um, how to win people from milieus where the use of open source techno technology as a possible hobby is unknown? Yeah, that is a really good question. Something that I would really like to do is to go into high schools, especially in Neukölln where I live. In Neukölln there are many people from, especially the Middle East, many people um, from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and I would really love to run workshops there for free for, for the school students. Unfortunately my time is limited, um, but I really hope that maybe in the future I can collaborate with organizations to, to do such things. Um, the next question is, um, are there initiatives by men for help with male fragility in open source, similar to coaching in white-only groups working against their own racism? Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, are there initiatives by men for helping, like, for help with male fragili fragility in open source? So I think if there are, like, initiatives for men where they can um, ask themselves about their, men, uh, like their male fragility, Hmm, how do I answer the question? I think it's really important to be a good ally and to not judge people. Um, for example, I mean, we all make mistakes. I also make mistakes sometimes. And when I do, I, I feel shit. <laughs> but it is also important that when we make mistakes that we don't judge people for that and don't be like, hey, you're, you're an asshole or something like that. Um, I think it's really important that we say like, hey, I understand that you didn't do this on purpose and um, I can see that this wasn't your intention to, to hurt someone. Um, so I think it's really important to, to be a good ally and say like, hey, we all need to do better, we're all learning um, and to yeah, generally be supportive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the next question is um, on GitHub. Um, also, being anonymous isn't necessarily positive. We should encourage diverse people to be open about their diversity. So this is not, not a question, but a comment. Um, and also another comment, um, it helps also to have a training for bystander intervention and for allyship to get knowledge where are problems. I don't know, I don't get the, pro the, the comment. Do you get it? Is it a question? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, more, no more questions so far, anybody? Yeah, but it's also um, time's up, so yes, thank you very much. Uh, one last one? Yeah. <laughs> yes, in uh, many, in many, especially the smaller projects, there is a very difficult um, diverse contributor to get on board, uh, namely the first one. Um, do you have any hints on 
how to uh, how to support that first person or how to find find them because I think they have a much harder time than the second one. That's a good point. Come to Pi Ladies events <laughs> and other events, other meetups that um, focus on underrepresented groups in tech, I would say, um, and ask for support. Like, if that's available to you, I mean, often many meetups are only in bigger cities and um, so, you know, some people need to travel. Um, but online support is also available. Um, for example, at Pi Ladies, we sometimes offer speaker support. Um, we also offer on online contributing to various open source projects support, maybe something in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Maren. Thanks. <laughs>